Yeah, so the title is pretty long, and I'm going to break it down to like three different components. Uh, so I'm Troy. I'm an applied scientist at Amazon Web Services. And these are my co-authors. I just grabbed their photos from phone tools. It's not very flattering for them. Um, so we're going to have three components. The first one is linear regression. And then we're going to do linear regression with differential privacy guarantees. And then we're trying to improve a you know state of the art from maybe 2022 uh, using gradient boosting. Um, so the problem setup. Uh, so problem setup is very easy, straightforward and uh, easy to understand. We're trying to solve a linear regression problem. So given the joint distribution D over the features X in high dimension P, P and labels Y in one dimension, we're trying to find the parameter theta, parameter vector theta in, um, in dimension P to minimize the uh, empirical loss on the data distribution. And we're going to do this linear regression with differential privacy. So I just, I yesterday I realized that I'm going to be the first one to talk about differential privacy. So I'm going to give you a little bit introduction of this. So just imagine that uh, I have a database and then someone is going to ask a question to this database and then the answer to this, to the question is zero. So differential privacy says that I'm not going to tell you zero. I'm going to draw a sample from a Gaussian distribution around zero. So you can see that instead of telling you the exact answer, I'm going to give you an approximate answer from this blue distribution. And then if someone else, for example, without differential privacy, someone else asks a question with try, what's the answer would be? And the answer turns to be, the true answer turns out to be one. Differential privacy says that no, I'm, gonna I'm not gonna tell you one. I'm gonna draw a sample from this red distribution. So you can see that without differential privacy, by comparing the answers, two true answers, zero and one, the attacker can tell whether I exist in the database or not. So it violates my privacy. But with differential privacy, those two answers I'm not going to tell you the exact answer of those two questions. I'm only going to draw two samples from those two distributions. So this is where uh, differential privacy comes in. And this is specifically a Gaussian mechanism. And uh, so in order to quantify how much privacy loss uh, we need, so the width of this Gaussian distribution, standard deviation, uh, has an impact on the privacy loss. And also how different these two, uh, the means of those two Gaussian distributions are, uh, will also have an impact on privacy loss. Um, so formally, we can use epsilon delta language to define the differential privacy. So basically, it means that um, the answer, the randomized algorithm, the answer from this randomized algorithm cannot differ so much controlled by epsilon delta when I change one person's data from this database. And specifically, we can also define the Gaussian um, mechanism in this way. It looks a little bit messy, but later on, uh, later on, a group of people from uh, uh, UPenn found a way to make it more simpler, make it uh, make much simpler. So they introduced the idea called the uh, um, uh, Gaussian differential privacy, and it is specifically designed for using Gaussian mechanism. So what you can see over here is just that you know, for a Gaussian mechanism, this is the answer to the original question, and then with a random noise drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And then you can say, see that the Gaussian is defined by how much the answer will change and a privacy loss. So this is much simpler. You know, we're only using one parameter to denote this Gaussian mechanism and instead of two. So the reason that we're interested in using Gaussian differential privacy is that first, Gaussian differential privacy provides a tighter bound on the privacy loss when you are only using Gaussian mechanism. And then also at the same level of privacy loss, for example, you have, same, you have the privacy loss for the database and privacy loss for individual questions. Then Gaussian mechanism, a Gaussian differential privacy actually allows more interactions with the data, database, which means that you can ask more questions. So, uh, which means that if you want to design some complicated systems and you are only using Gaussian differential privacy, I'm uh, sorry, you are using, only using Gaussian mechanism, you should consider Gaussian differential privacy. So that's a very quick, uh, introduction to differential privacy, uh, like from the, uh, with only the Gaussian mechanism and also the epsilon delta language and also the Gaussian differential privacy language. And then we're going to talk about the a little bit relative work on the uh, linear regression with differential privacy. So there are different ways of doing uh, linear regression with differential differential privacy guarantees. Uh, so we can do opt, uh, objective perturbation rather than optimizing for the original L2 loss. We can add some perturbation to it so that. Uh, we don't leak individual information or like leak the uh, existence of individuals in, uh, to the, uh, through the released parameters. Second way is a like very interesting way called call subsample and aggregate. Um, and then we're gonna, uh, there's an algorithm defined by Google folks, I think. Uh, it's very effective. 
And then the third one is posterior sampling, and we have noisy stochastic gradient descent. By the way, the, uh, the algorithm, differentially private stochastic gradient descent, is usually using Gaussian mechanism. And then they, a lot of times, they just use the Gaussian differential privacy to do the composition over them. So you can more e efficiently use the uh, privacy parameters. And uh, the last one is called the adaptive sufficient statistic perturbation. So it turns out that the last one is still actually a very um, effective algorithm for linear regression, and it's a one-shot algorithm as well. So we're going to try to see what we can improve on this algorithm. So this, is, this algorithm is called adaptive uh, sufficient statistic perturbation. So what we all know that for linear regression, there's a, or for ridge regression, let's say, with a little bit uh, you know, regularization on it. So the analytical solution to the ridge regression looks like this. So we have the inverse of the coherence matrix plot with a little bit of regularization, and then we have the cross term. And the regularization is determined by the smallest eigenvalue of the coherence matrix. So that's why this approach is called adaptive. Uh, the adaptivity comes from the fact that we're using the smallest eigenvalue of, this ma of the uh, um, coherence matrix as a regularization term. Um, so in order to make it differentially private, I know there's a lot of stuff there. So what it means to be sufficient statistic perturbation is just that we have, so for this uh, analytical solution, we have three different statistics. The first one is covariance matrix. Second one is the smallest eigenvalue. And then the, the third term is the cross term. So what it means is that we're just going to add Gaussian noise to all those three statistics terms, statistics. And then uh, based on the post-processing theorem, as long as those three statistics, ter statistics are differentially private, anything we do on those three statistics terms is also differentially private. So then theta itself will also be differentially private. So the first thing is that we need to add noise to um, the coherence, coherence term. Um, so the thing is that for, in order to add noise to the coherence term, we know that we need to know, uh, we know from the previous introduction in the differential privacy that we need to know how much the coherence matrix term will change if we remove or add, just basically add, remove, or replace a single data sample. So that knowledge is usually not public information. So in added SP, what it assumes is that we know what that, what that number is. So they assume that they have the uh, public information about this, uh, you know, the change or the, or the change that a removing, adding, or replacing a single data sample will cause. So we add Gaussian noise to the coherence term, and then we add uh, we add noise to the cross term, and then we add noise to the uh, regularization term. And based on uh, the Gaussian differential privacy, we can have we can see that this algorithm is actually square root of mu one, those three terms together. And the limitation of that is just, like I said, uh, to obtain boundary sensitivity for privacy analysis, there are two pre-processing steps. So like the normal features needs to be clipped so that the maximum norm of all features is uh, the norm of this domain. And the label Y also needs to be clipped so that the maximum absolute value of all that labels is uh, the a norm of this uh, label domain. So the analysis of LSP and also the effectiveness of LSP requires data bounds on features and labels to be known, uh, or at least to be they have to be public information, which may not be uh, very true, which may not be true like in a lot of situations. So we, we're thinking about can we do some improvements to get rid of that kind of dependency on the uh, public information. So um, the potential improvement is that we can. We can do we can do data independent clipping. So how to do data independent and clipping? And then we're going to use the gradient boosting to introduce this idea. Uh, so gradient boosting is a really good algorithm for neural networks. We all know that. Um, so it basically asks you to learn additive uh, models uh, in a stage-wise fashion. So we learn the first model based on the x and y, and then we gradually learn the uh, learn to regress to the residuals of the model of the previous model. And then we do that uh, step by step, and then we build a, forest of, uh, we build a, a, a sequence of um, uh, models, and then we add them together as the final predictor. So we're going to chain the uh, gradient boosting with, uh, with linear models, or we are going to use linear models to approximate the gradients functional, in the functional space in gradient boosting. So we first initialize the parameters to be 0. And then in each boosting round, we calculate the residuals from this current step. And then based on the residual, we learn a linear model on top of it 
So this is a linear linear solution to ridge regression. What we're doing over here is just that we're using a linear model to approximate the functional space gradient, and then we update the parameter. So what we know is that at the end of the day, the model is still linear. So you know that without different privacy or without any kind of like clipping or anything, there will be no improvement after the first round because it's still linear. First round linear, second round linear, third round linear is always linear. But with differential privacy, the situation becomes quite different. So this is where our algorithm kicks in. It's called boosted theta SP. Uh, what we do is that first, we still initialize theta to be zero. And then we clip all the, uh, the norms of all the features to be one or uh, to, uh, to be the, uh, to be, to be the uh, theta independent clipping bound tau x. And then we release two statistics uh, privately. So the first one is private coherence matrix. Second one is private regularization term. And then we do function space, we calculate the function space gradient, which is residual. And then we clip the residual based on our, um, based on the data independent and clipping bound for labels. And then we add noise uh, to release this privately. And then we solve a uh, ridge regression problem and then we update the parameters. So in this way, we can actually see some improvements after the first round because even though we're doing linear regression, but the clippings makes the problem different. So this is boosted at SP. And we compare to some existing algorithms. The first one is added SP because we're building on top of it. We want to show that we're able to do better than that. Second one is two key, is subsample and aggregate. So it solves linear regression problems on individual destroying subsets and it aggregates parameter vectors privately. It doesn't require data bounds on features or labels, but it does require the number of sub, uh, in destroying subsets to be set. And then the last one is DPEBM, differential recovery explainable boosting machine. So it learns differential private trees with random data splits and is able to, is capable of approximating nonlinear functions. So the first three algorithms are still linear. Um, the last one is nonlinear. So we tried it on the 33 open ML tabular data sets for regression and then easy, uh, the, uh, the very straightforward evaluation metrics is mean spread error. And then we compared uh, in two conditions. The first one is we wanna see what's the optimal performance of individual algorithms. So we used Optuna to tune hyperparameters for every single algorithm. The second set is that we just set the uh, uh, hyperparameters of individual algorithm as recommended based on their associated papers for all data sets. So over here, it is, we made it easier to understand the x axis, the comparison algorithm, y, y axis, our algorithm. So diagonal line means that we're performing the same. And below the diagonal line means that we're doing better. And above the uh, diagonal line means that we're doing worse. Um, so on, so we first compared to non-privately tuned boosted SP and non-privately tuned at SP. We're doing better than that because we allow gradient boosting to adjust uh, to gradually reduce the residuals. And when we set, so the second row represents that we use fixed hyperparameters for our algorithm, but we still tune the hyperparameters for the comparison algorithm. It just so shows that our algorithm can sometimes do better than the optimal performance of the um, uh, comparison algorithm. So we can see that we sort of like do similarly to LSP when our algorithm, uh, when hyperparameters of our, of our algorithm are fixed, but we uh, non-privately tune at SP. So this is a comparison with Tuki. Um, like overall, we are actually doing well um, in both conditions compared to Tuki and also with DPBM. Um, so in order to, sh so we have shown that on those like uh, 33 open ML regression data sets, we can do better when we, when we even, even with fixed hyperparameters for all the different data sets. What we want to show now is to show that we are actually robust to outliers. Um, um, yes, the outliers over here. So the percentage, we sort of, we run this set of experiments in a way that we can control the number of outliers in the database. So for example, P represents the percentage of the outliers. Uh, 0 0.001 means uh, 1% and this means 10%. So we can see that ours can do better when the, uh, when the total number of um, outliers is large, but 2 em actually does pretty well when the number of uh, outliers is very small. And we did two different corruptions, label corruption and features corruption. So the observation is kind of similar. So our recommendation over here is that, you know, we're not saying that our algorithm is the best. What we do is to say, with the information you have, you have these options. The first thing is if you know the data bounds, if the data bounds are public information, try add SP first. It is a one-shot linear regression algorithm, it's really good. 
And if the number of data samples is a thousand times larger than the dimension of the data recommended by the paper, try 2EM. It's a fantastic algorithm if you have a lot of data points. So if you don't have either of these aforementioned conditions, then try our boosted LSP. So if you don't know, uh, you don't know the data bounds, you don't have a lot of data samples, try our algorithm. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you.